Father God, we honor you today. Lord, we praise you, we lift you, we magnify you. Lord, we confess, Father God, that there is no one, there is no thing, there is no body, there is no one like you. We thank you, Father God, that you're able to touch our hearts like you do. We thank you for being able to bless us and allowing us to trust you. Lord, we thank you for your track record, it's sure. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us on tonight, that we will search your word again, for we re realize that there's life in your word. There's strength in your word. There is hope in your word. And Lord, we thank you for it tonight. Lord, Father God, we confess that we have not followed your word the way we ought to. We have fallen short. We've sinned. We've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. We ask you to bless us tonight, Father God. Forgive us for our sins. Don't allow anything to hinder us or to hold us from being blessed of you through your word. Lord, we thank you now. We bless your name now. We praise you for all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. there is none there is no one there is none like the god we serve he is the awesome and the amazing god he is god all by himself thank you for joining us again tonight for our bible study we're in colossians chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 we'll be dealing with verses 7 through 11 on tonight colossians chapter 4 verses 7 through 11 on tonight. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 on tonight is where we will be tonight. We sure do bless the Lord for what he has done, how he's kept us, and how he has blessed us. We thank God for who he is and what he has already done. We serve the uh, amazing, the awesome, the great God. And I want to tell you, in case you didn't know tonight, there is nobody like our God. There is no thing like our God. There is none like our God. Colossians chapter 4, verses number 7 through 11 is where we will hang our hats on tonight. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. This is known, this particular portion of this pericope is known as Paul's final greeting or Paul's final instructions to the church at Colossae. The entire pericope is covered through verse, verses 7 through verse number 11 through verse number 18 is where the entire pericope is covered. However, it is broken down and I will break it down into three different pericopes, meaning I will break it down into three different thoughts on tonight. So Paul is writing this letter at the church of, to the church at Colossae, and he's saying his final greetings in his letter to the Colossians in the book of Colossians. We're in Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Uh, he, he talks about the fact that he's in prison. He is still locked up. He is still locked up for sharing the word of God, for doing that which is right. He wasn't arrested for doing something wrong. He, he was arrested for spreading the word of God. Now we have some arrests going on, but people are not being arrested for the word of God. They're being arrested for other things. But Paul here is, is focused 
on the word of God and he is keeping the word of God before him and before others, even while he is locked up in jail. The Apostle Paul, let's look at verse number seven. We'll, we'll close out at verse number 11. That's about all of the pericope we can handle for tonight. But Paul begins in verse number seven, and I'm reading uh, the New King James Version. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Verses seven and eight, Paul introduces two characters. He introduced Tychicus and he introduces Onesimus. Now he says Tychicus is a beloved brethren. So by him saying that he's a beloved brethren, he's saying to all of us that we need to understand that he is of the family of faith. He has been saved. He's been born again. He is a beloved brother with Paul. He is one who made sure that he accompanied Paul. He accompanied Paul on one of his missionary journeys when he went to take up money from the church in Jerusalem. I'm telling you during that period, the apostle Paul, along with other ministers, would go from one church to the other to serve whatever purpose they had. And the apostle Paul allowed Tychicus to accompany him to Jerusalem with a collection for the church there. So the apostle Paul and Tychicus went and they took a, a bunch of money. At that time, it was a bunch of money. And what they did, they went to bless the church. In those days, one church would bless the ministry of the man of God, and the man of God would take an offering from another group of people to a local church. So at this particular time, Tychicus was one of those disciples of Paul who was a personal representative of Paul, a, purpose, a, a personal representative of the church. He was a beloved brother, meaning that people liked him. He was a brother because he was born again. He was a brother because he had received Christ as his personal savior. Those of us who are watching and listening to me tonight, you must be, you got to be, you have to be born again in order to be a brother. Uh, yeah, we are all brothers because God is our father, but in order to be one of these beloved brothers that the Apostle Paul talks about, you have to yield your body, mind, soul to Jesus Christ. You have to be born again. He goes on to say, not only is he a beloved brother, he is a faithful minister. So he has been called. He has been touched by the Holy Spirit to minister to people. He has been called, Tychicus has been called by the Almighty God to represent God to the people. He has been called to be a voice to the people in front of God and in front of the people on behalf of God. He is a faithful minister. He says he's a faithful minister. Now I want to say to every preacher, every teacher, every person who has been called by God, even if you just been called to cook tea cakes, be one who is faithful. Be somebody who is faithful. If you are called to administrate, be faithful. If you are called to usher or to present yourself before others as they walk in the room, be faithful. 
If you are called to be a wife, if you are called to be a parent, you need to be faithful to your calling. What does it profit you to put your hands to the plow and then turn away from it? Jesus says it like this. You are not faithful, and when you put your hand to the plow, you are not worthy of following him, and you are not worthy of being his disciple. So Paul says Tychicus was worthy. Tychicus was faithful. He was a minister of the Lord. Don't pass over that word faithful. We must be faithful to the Lord. We cannot allow simple stuff to stop us from being faithful. Yes. The Apostle Paul is in prison. The Apostle Paul is locked up. He was not in prison throwing a pity party. He was in prison ministering. And he says, Tychicus was also faithful. We must be faithful to the God who has called us. We must be faithful to the God who has saved us. We must be more faithful to the God who has saved us than we are to our employer. Because the God who has saved us has allowed us to have a job. And if God shuts down something, he can shut down the whole job. That's right. If you're more faithful to your employer mm -hmm. than you are to God, then you're not faithful to God at all. Jesus says, if you put your hand on the plow and then you stop plowing, then you're not worthy of being his disciple. That's My right. question tonight is, are you worthy mm -hmm. of being God's disciple? Are you worthy and are you faithful to the Lord himself? We are faithful to a lot of things. We are faithful to, to people. We are faithful to things. But the question tonight, are you faithful to the almighty God? It's a sad day when preachers, teachers, leaders, community re leaders are not faithful to that which they say they are called. I understand really well. There are some who were sent, and there are some who just went. My question to you is, are you faithful? If you're called in ministry, are you faithful? I notice, I notice some, sometimes people can go to a church, and, and that church does not have a platform for them to stand behind the sacred desk of authority. I've noticed that that same person that will lead church A and go to church B, they are not doing much at church B, just like they wasn't doing much at church A. But if you're called and you're faithful, you don't need a podium, you don't need a pulpit, yes. you don't need a church, you're going to be faithful to the call of God. Yes, right. These days, these days, preachers all over the world are preaching from their living room, their dens, their bedrooms because they're faithful to the Lord. And then there are preachers who are standing in the pulpit who are preaching to empty pews every Sunday and every Wednesday and every Tuesday. It's because they are faithful to getting the word out. They are faithful to God. These men and women of God are faithful to what God has called them to do, and they're going to do it even in a dire situation. And we can't even get people to share this video. I'm asking you to be faithful to sharing the video. I'm asking you to be faithful to, to create a live watch party. I'm asking you to be faithful to praying for the men of God, the woman of God, the children of God, the church of God. Just pray. Yes. And we ought to be faithful to it. In verses 1 through 6 on last week, I told you that Paul says, whatever you do, pray for us who are in ministry. And now if, if you have not been faithful in praying for the person who stands before you in ministry, now is a good time to start. If you have not been faithful to listening as we are, listening to the word of God, journeying down, writing down what God is speaking in your spirit, now's a good time to get started. If you have not been faithful 
to reading your daily reading that leads up to Sunday school, now is the time to get started. Yes. And if you have just slipped up and gotten behind, now is the time to catch up. Paul says that Tychicus was a faithful minister. Yes. It, it, it bothers me. It really bothers me. It really gets on my nerve when I hear a preacher, a minister say that he is called to ministry, but he's not doing ministry. Mm -hmm. If you're called to a thing, you ought to be doing the thing, and you should not let anything or anybody stop you from doing it. My question today, because you're born again, you ought to be a witness for the Lord. Who are you witnessing to? Are you faithful? Are you faithful? Are you, are you on top of things regardless of what goes on around you? It's not just a place for the preacher. It's not just a place for the pastor to be faithful. Paul says that Tychicus was a faithful minister. And because he was faithful, he became a personal representative with Paul. Represent God. He made a couple trips a couple times with Paul. He, he went to Ephesus. He, he went to Colossae. And, and Paul is saying here, as he comes to the close of, of, uh, of the letter to the Colossians, he says, remember those who worked with me in ministry. Mm -hmm. He says, first of all, I want you to know that, that, that Tychicus, I'm sending him to you, and he's been faithful. You see, people are more apt to listen to people who are faithful in ministry. Yes, Lord. They, they, they don't want to hear from Johnny come lately, and they don't want to hear from somebody that, that get all pumped up just for a season, but then they just fizzle out. It is a telltale sign when someone is called of God, they will do it even when it's burdensome. They will do it even when they don't have the luxuries that they are used to. We have to make sure that we are faithful. He goes on to say, not only is he a faithful minister, not only is he a, a beloved brother, but he is a fellow servant in the Lord. Paul described Tychicus as a fellow servant. So he ministers to the people. But not only that, he served the people, he served the church, and he serves on behalf of the Lord. My question to you today, are you a servant of the Most High God? Are you a servant in the Lord? Has the Lord touched your heart so much so until you are not taking advantage of this time out? You are not taking advantage of this coronavirus but you're still serving the Lord. Find some way to serve the Lord. Yes. We have to be servants unto the Lord. If you can't sing in the church, you ought to be serving. If you can't usher in the church, you ought to be serving. Somebody ought to be getting blessed from your missionary work in the Lord. He says he's a fellow servant in the Lord. Will tell you all the good news about me. Now listen at Paul. He's locked up in a prison talking about good news. <laughs> Let me just share with you. Uh, Romans, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 28, that, that and we know, or for we know, since we know, all things will work together for the good to them that love the Lord and to them that are the call according to his purpose. Let me just share with you. If you focus on God, it will work out. If if regardless of what goes on behind the scene, regardless of who digs ditches for you, just trust the Lord, it'll work out. Paul says that all things work together. And the thing about it is, you may get a piece here, a piece there, a piece there, and when God brings those broken pieces together, they work out together for the good. That's why, that's why a woman can get a piece of man, a man can get a piece of woman. With God in the middle, God can work it all out for the good. One lady said, I'm just glad I got a piece of man. Because she was convinced that if God touches that piece of man's heart, 
he can become a giant in the presence of the Lord. So Paul says, he says that Tychicus will tell you good news about me. What is good news of being locked up? I, I've oftentimes told my daughter, I've told my, my wife that I'll take a bullet for them. I will, I will die for them, but I'm not going to jail for you. I, I don't want to have anything to do with locked up. I don't want to have anything to do with restriction. I don't want to have anything to do with going to jail. But here Paul is locked up in prison, having a problem, but he's still talking about Tychicus will tell you those things, all the good things, all the good news about me. He says, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose. Paul says, I'm sending Tychicus to you for the very purpose of letting you know the good things that's going on. Some people would be moaning, groaning, throwing a pity party. They would be all up in the air because they don't have their freedom that they once had and they don't have the freedom that they love. Paul says, even though I don't have my freedom, I tell you what, there are some good things taking place. There's some good news about me. Paul is in prison, ministering to the prisons. Paul is in prison, breaking yokes through the Holy Spirit. Paul is in prison. He is in prison. He can even hear Nero's chopping block, getting ready to chop his head off, but he's still saying there's some good things. Paul has a death sentence. He knows he's going to die. When we look at Timothy and we get to the end of the book of Timothy, Paul says, bring your coat. <laughs> bring my coat, rather. He says, my time is up. I fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. I got laid up for me a crown of glory in heaven. People cannot see the goodness of the crown of glory because they're so consumed with what they're going through right now. Let me just serve you notice today, dear. Regardless of what you're going through right now, regardless of what's going on with you right now, God has a crown of glory for those who are faithful. Paul says, Paul says, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished my course. And I know there is laid up for me a crown of glory. So he says, verse number eight, I am sending him to you for this very purpose. What very purpose? So he can tell you of the good news that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. So Paul understands that the, the news that is going to be taken back and forth. Number one, the news will be so they will know Paul's circumstances. Mm -hmm. Number two, so Paul will know their circumstances. How are you doing? And number three, so they will be comforted and encouraged. Paul wants them to be encouraged. Every leader ought to want to know how those who follow him are doing. That's why everybody can't, everybody can't pastor because everybody doesn't have a pastor's heart. When you have a pastor's heart, you're concerned about people, especially those who follow you. Those of you who are on the broadcast today, whether you are members of our church or not, I'm concerned about you because you're following even this presentation. If it's your first time here today, I'm concerned about you because you are following me. In spite of the fact that Paul had never been to Colossae, he's never met these people, he still knew that there was a bond that bonded them together. That bond was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Because when we look at Christ, it does not matter whether we are part of the same church, whether we have met each other before, but when we look into each other's hearts and God every now and then allows us to take a peep over into the saint's heart and we are bound together through the Holy Spirit because Christ brings unity among all of us. 
We ought to have unity in Christ. We, we ought not have, we ought not be divided like the great United States of America. <laughs> the church ought to set the example that's very much needed for the United States of America. A church must, must set the example. A church, the church must set the example for the United States of America. And I dare tell you, the church must set the example for the entire world. Jesus says it like this. He said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love, by your love for one another. First of all, the church has to love each other. We ought to be bound together in unity. In order to comfort each other's heart, we have to be bound together in unity. We ought to be on one accord. Preachers ought to be able to get along. Pastors ought not be in conflict with other pastors. Because parishioners notice it, parishioners see it, and then they're in conflict with each other. We ought to not be so frustrating toward each other. We ought to love each other, and we have to have unity one to the other. Even though Paul had never met them, had not been to Colossae, he writes this letter to them because he knows, he knows that the unity that one finds in Christ Jesus ought to exist whether we've come in contact with each other or not. Matter of fact, let me just parenthetically throw this in here. Regardless of our color, regardless of our race, and they are different, regardless of our national origin, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our creed, regardless of what we believe, if we're all in Christ, we ought to have unity one with the other. Yes. When somebody else's child gets strung out on drug, it ought to tear us apart. We ought not gossip about it. We ought not talk about it. When somebody else's daughter gets, gets uh, involved in prostitution, we ought to hurt also. Because we are bound, we are bond, bonded together on one accord through love. We ought to have unity for each other. And Paul says that Tychicus is going to come and he is going to tell you the good news and he's going to tell of your circumstances and he's going to comfort your heart. Let me just say to those who are called to teach, we are called to comfort the hearts of the people. When we show up, we are called to comfort the hearts of the people. I was able to, to take, take witness to uh, a funeral taking place and the pastor never showed up. He couldn't make it. But he had trained the deacons and the teachers in that church well enough that one of the deacons stood and brought the word and encouraged the people over the deceased. My question to you today, are you faithful enough to be prepared to do what God has called you to do even when you're not the person on program. Mm -hmm. you, you gotta be, you have to be, you have to be prepared. You have to be walking with God and allow God to use you even though you're not a preacher. Yes, sir. Young ladies, young men, allow the Lord to use you because you have the blessings of God even if you're not a preacher. So he says he, he's going to comfort your heart. He's going to bring you good news. And this, this good news is going to be encouragement to you. We ought to be running to encourage somebody. And now people are hurting more than we have ever known in our lifetimes. People need to hear a word from you. I know you thought I was going to say God, they need a word from the Lord. Yes, they do need a word from the Lord. But that word is going to come through you. God has no feet but our feet. He has no hands but our hands. We have to tell people about the goodness of God. And we got every means necessary. We got every medium we need to tell people about the goodness of God. We got every means we need to comfort somebody, to encourage somebody. We ought to choose at least five people, six, seven, to ten people every week to comfort them to call them, spend at least an hour just talking to a group of people 
It doesn't take but two to three to 15 minutes to call somebody and just to say, I've been praying for you. Hang in there. Don't give up. Yes. Somebody tonight may be on the verge of suicide and you can speak into their lives and they will hear from you. All you have to do is be faithful in calling, faithful in talking to them. Somebody may be standing on the ledge tonight. I want to say to you, get off the ledge. Trust God. Be faithful in ministry. Encourage somebody's heart. Verse number nine, he says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave. I can see me <laughs> in Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He was a native of Colossae. He had a slave owner. He, was, he had a slave owner and he chose to run away from. Mm -hmm. And when he chose to run away, guess where he ended up? In prison. Paul said, I am sending Tychicus and Onesimus. Onesimus is faithful also. Look at the people that God used. God uses... People who are faithful. The problem is people want to give God 5%, but want God to give them 10%. Ooh, good God Almighty. People want God to give them 100%. But we will give God 10% and then get upset with God because God is not giving us 100%. I want to serve notice on you today. God is giving you 100%. It's time for you to give God 100%. I didn't say 105. I didn't say 110. Because, you know, if you give him 100%, that's all you can give. Yes. You don't need to try to give him 150%. Give God 100%. Give God your time. Give God your treasure. Give God what he has asked for in your talent. Give it to God. Give God 100%. Somebody that's listening to me need to start giving God 1%. Mm -hmm. Years ago, one of the coaches of the L.A. Lakers asked the Lakers basketball team, National Basketball Association team, one of the coaches asked the L.A. Lakers, just give me 1% more than what you're giving. Just give me just a little more of what you're giving now. And from that day forward, that team became one of the greatest dynasties of all times. If we commit to being faithful to God, because God is faithful to us, if we commit to being faithful to God, God can always and he will be faithful to us. He will. He, he will. He, he is the epitome of faithfulness. Onesimus, a runaway slave that has now become a beloved brother, meaning that he's born again. Let me just say to you, don't judge people who've been in jail. Don't run away from everybody who's been in jail. I oftentimes told the guys that used to visit our church when you come, don't go and blast it out and tell everybody you've been in jail, you've been in prison. Because the people of our local churches have not arrived yet. They don't think that once you've served your purpose, once you've served your cause, once you've paid your debt to society, it is really paid and they don't believe that you're different. Wait for a while, just get involved in the ministry, do your very best in the ministry, and then when they find out that you've been in prison or you've been in jail, then they love you and they will call you a beloved brother. The proof is in the pudding. We have to get to a point where we are faithful and then people will be willing to call us beloved brothers and beloved sisters. He says, verse number nine, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? So Paul tells them that Onesimus is one of you. He reminds them, even though this brother been in prison for running away as a slave, 
He's just like you. Matter of fact, he came from you. He is one of you. He's a native of Colossae. He's one of you. Allow him to return. And so Paul sent Tychicus with Onesimus so Tychicus could be a moral support to Onesimus. Let me just say to you, sometimes you need somebody to speak for you. Sometimes you need somebody to give you credit in the presence of others. Sometimes you need somebody to stand up for you. Somebody who has respect that you won't have except somebody brings you along and say, don't bother him, he's with me. We have to get to a point that we understand really well that somebody's got to speak up for us. Somebody has to speak up for us because we all deserve prison. <laughs> we all, we, every last one of us, I don't care how smooth you are. I don't care how holy you are. You deserve to be locked up because you have done something wrong. And if you don't deserve to be locked up in our local prison, you de deserve to be locked up by the angels of God because you've been wrong. You've done some things wrong. And even if you think you don't deserve to be locked up, that's enough right there for you to be locked up. 1 John 1 and 9 says that you have to confess your sin and God will be faithful and just to cleanse you from all your sin. But verse number eight starts off talking about that if a man says that he has not sinned, he tells a lie. The truth ain't in him. Let me tell you, we all have sinned. We all deserve a spin number. We all deserve a number. Uh, my number may be BR549. Your number may be S-P-H-T-Z. But at the end of the day, we all have messed up. So Paul is saying to the church at Colossae, accept Onesimus. Accept him. Matter of fact, I'm sending Tychicus with him so Tychicus can show people, hey, he with me. He's all right now. He's been saved. Let me tell you, criminals can be saved. Criminals can be born again. Those who broke into, and I say literally broke into the capital, need salvation. Now, they need jail too now, <laughs> but they need salvation. There's no doubt about it. They need to pay for what they've done, as many of us would have to pay and have paid for what we have done. But the fact of the matter is they need Jesus. If they had Jesus in their heart, then they wouldn't have done what they've done. Because when you have Jesus in your heart, you think about what Jesus would feel about it before you've done it. So he says, he says, he's one of you. He says, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. They, they, will, they will let you know what's going on with me and what's going on with others who are in prison. <laughs> in other words... Paul had turned this prison into his own personal ministry. And he's sending witnesses to the church of Colossae to remind them that you need to be witnessing and you need to turn your life towards someone else so someone else can get to know Jesus. The problem is we are not locked up, but we are not telling people about Jesus. We're holding grudges, but we're not telling people about Jesus. We, we are going about our day. We are saved and we are on our way to, to see Jesus, but we're not telling people about the Jesus we're on our way to see. Mm -hmm. Verse number 10, it says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner greets you. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, he greets you. In other words, he's saying, howdy, how you doing? He's saying, he said, uh, I wish you well. He greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, why is it that Paul has to talk about Mark? Mark is the same Mark that wrote the book of Mark that we read in the New Testament. His name really is John Mark. John Mark... The reason why Paul has to talk about John Mark 
is because John Mark was a scary cat. You see, in ministry, sometimes things get heated. In ministry, sometimes when things don't go well, we need somebody to stand flat foot with us with our backs to each other saying, I got your back and you got mine. Come, Sister Davis, come, hurry, hurry, Sister Davis. We need somebody, we need somebody, we need somebody to face the opposite direction. We need somebody to face the opposite direction, and she shouldn't be looking at me, she should be looking this way. <laughs> if she's going to be a blessing, if, if she's going to be supportive, I need to know from her that she got my back. She needs to know from me that I have her back. And if any time there's a question of that, thank you, ma'am. If any time there's a question of that, then I understand that I need somebody to get my back. That was the situation here with Paul and John Mark. Here he's called Mark. John Mark was the one that when stuff got tough on the first missionary journey that the Apostle Paul went on, John Mark got out of there. John Mark <laughs> moved over. John Mark got out of the way. He had been arrested. And John Mark said, this ministry thing ain't for me. John Mark said, I, I can't handle this. I, I, I can't take this. See, John Mark wasn't well known by the Church of Colossae. But in the ministry, he had a bad reputation of running off when he was needed. God deliver me from preachers, from teachers, from church members who would just run off when they're called upon. If you're faithful to God, if you're a servant of the Lord, you have to be willing to stay there and hang in there when times get tough. So Paul says, you don't know John Mark that well because he ran off from the ministry, but you do know Barnabas. Now he's a cousin of Barnabas. So when he come to you, receive him. John Mark, Barnabas' cousin, or Mark, Barnabas' cousin, about whom you received, in, received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. So now Paul has gotten to a point where he, he's able to receive John Mark. He's able to receive Mark well. There, is, there are elements of forgiveness here. <laughs> Paul says, even though he ran off, and some theologians even put it like this, he ran back home to his mommy's house. Even though he ran back home to his mommy's house when things got tough, Paul says, I've forgiven him from that, and don't y'all hold it against him. He says, be receptive of him. He said, you've received instructions already, but be receptive of him. Welcome him. Verse number 11. He, he closes out this portion of the pericope in verse number 11. He says, in Jesus, who is called justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Now, when he talks about these are the only brothers of the circumcision, he means these are our, all the Jewish brothers. In other words, these Jews have been circumcised not by their bodies, but they've been circumcised in their hearts. He says these are the one, only one who are Jews who have, who have been circumcised in their hearts. They have been changed. They have been delivered. So first of all, he talks about the fact that Onesimus has been delivered from a prison, has been delivered in his heart from doing wrong. And now he talks about those who have been delivered from the rituals, from the customs of the Jewish law. He says, he says, and Jesus, who is justice. 
This is not Jesus, God's only begotten son. The name Jesus was a common name during that time. Somebody just got educated. The name Jesus was a common name, and that's why you had to identify Jesus as Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ, or Jesus the anointed one, or Jesus the son of man, or Jesus the son of God. Because Jesus was a common name. And so here he goes, he says, Jesus, who is called Justice. That, that was a common name, Jesus. This word Justice means righteous. He says, these three. Mark, Justice, and Aristarchus are among the ones who were fellow Christians with Paul. These are the Jewish Christians. These three are the three that have changed their lives, who have begun to walk after Christ Jesus. They have not only left the things that they were reared up in, they have left all these rituals that they used to do in the Jewish profession, in the Jewish law. Now they are Christians. Now they are Christians. Now they are no longer Gentiles. They are Jews that love the Lord. These men had proven to be a comfort to Paul. They had proven to stand with Paul, stand by Paul. Paul had called them in the missionary journey, and when he called them in the missionary journey, he had called them Gentiles. Yet he had to keep their concern for the loss on their nation, Israel. They had a concern from lost people. They had changed, and they wanted others changed. My statement to you today is you ought to be so concerned about other people changing. You ought to be so concerned about them changing that you ought to become active in their change. He says, and Jesus, who is called justice, these are my only fellow workers from the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision." They have proved to be a comfort to me. In case you don't know, the preacher needs somebody to be a comfort to him. <laughs> the preacher needs somebody who's willing to change from their normal customs. He needs somebody who will break away from the fold, break away from their family and their friends to be a comfort to him. Not one that will frustrate him, but comfort him. Yeah, he needs he needs somebody who he needs somebody who is willing to be a comfort. He needs somebody who have changed. So we have all these guys who have changed. Tychicus has changed. Onesimus has changed. Aristarchus has changed. Mark has changed. Jesus. Jesus, which is, which is called justice, he has changed. Jesus, the Christ, is the one who has changed all of them. Somebody may be listening to me tonight, and you're wondering how you're going to change. As they seek to legalize marijuana, let me just tell you, marijuana won't change you. As they seek to to make sure that we can carry guns as we please, guns will not change you. As you seek to buy your dream house, your house won't change you. As you seek to be with the right crowd and hang out with your gang, your gang will not change you. But Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the righteous one, Jesus, the one who died for you, he's the only one who can change you. You may be listening to me today and you want to change. I recommend Jesus, the son of God. Jesus, the, the righteous one. Jesus, the Christ. He's the one who died for you. He's the only one that can change you. 
The same Jesus took a cross. He carried it up Calvary's hill. He died on that cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But early that third day morning, Jesus, the Christ, got up from the dead. He rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Jesus Christ, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he died for you and he died for me. That same Jesus is available to you today. You can receive him just as you are. Regardless of where you came from, regardless of what your background is, regardless of how bad things have been for you and how bad you have been to things, you can receive Jesus Christ right here tonight. All I want you to do is bow your head and invite him into your heart. Believing this simple story that I've just told you, that Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of Man, Jesus the Christ took a tree and he carried his own tree up Calvary and they killed that Jesus. They took him off the cross. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. And early that third day morning, that same Jesus rose for you. Had it been not one single person on planet earth but you, he would have gotten up just for you because he loves you so much. If you want to receive Jesus, just bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite him into your life. If you have Jesus, you can go to heaven. If you have Jesus, you can be saved on planet earth. If you have Jesus, you can have a brand new life. Will you bow with me? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer and earnestly invited Jesus Christ into your life, we believe that you're born again, you're saved, you're on the way to heaven when you die or when Jesus returns. And there may be somebody who's listening to me today who, who have not been walking right, has not been serving right, have not been doing the things that God has called you to do. You're saved. You may be living a carnal life where you, you are saved, but you don't act like you're saved. You are saved, but you don't carry yourself like you're saved. And people don't think that you're saved because you're not walking with Jesus. I want you to recommit, rededicate your life to Jesus tonight. Ask him to come into your life and make you a new person. Uh, not not born again again because if you've been born again you've already born once and that's a, that's all it takes but make you a new person more committed to him make you a new person more determined to follow him and if you're here tonight and you've been trying to do your listening bible listening and your bible journaling and you say oh heck with this i don't know why he wants us to do this let me just say to you why don't you repent tonight? Why don't you get on board and trust the word of God? I'm not asking you to read it. I'm just asking you to listen and, and jot down what the Lord is saying. Right now is somewhere between two and four chapters a day. I want to say to you, it's not for me, but it is for you. The word of God makes us strong. The word of God blesses us. And then when it concerns us concerning our daily reading and meditation for the scriptures that lead up to, to our Sunday school service, I want you to participate in that. And it's only a few verses, maybe seven, eight, ten verses sometime. 
but the daily reading prepares you for to get your day started, to get your day motivated, to also keep the day going smoothly. But it also prepares you for Sunday school. So let's uh, let's participate. It's nothing hard. I say to you, as the slave girl said to to uh, to Elijah, say if it if it had been some hard, you would have done it. But the only thing the man of God says said to Naaman. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, Naaman. Naaman, if, if the man of God had said something hard to you, you would have jumped to do it. But all the man of God asks you to do is go and dip into the Jordan River seven times. I'm saying to you, all I'm asking you to do is give God a few minutes of your day to read the word, to listen to the word, and write down what the Lord has said to you. I'll be praying for you, I'll be, and you'll be praying for me. And there may be somebody who, who have not uh, been attending or have not claimed a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church where you can be a part of the church home. You can join online, just inbox me. You can join online in such a way that you'll be a full-fledged member of the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a great moment to be able to give to the Lord. It's a great thing to be able to give unto the Lord. Hallelujah. You can give unto the New Beginning Church in three forms. First of all, you can give by way of Cash App. You can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls dollar sign NBC Souls or cash tag NBC Souls or you can give by way of Zelle our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account or you can mail in your offering to New Beginning Church PO Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Thank you for joining us for Bible study tonight. You can join us every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live for Sunday School. You can join us for our worship service at 1045 a.m on Facebook Live and on Zoom. And you can continue to join us as you did tonight for our Bible study at 7.20 p.m. every Wednesday. Again, thank you so much for joining us. As we close out, we want to lift in prayer Sister Darrington. We want to lift in prayer the Smithers, Smolt, and Jordan families. We want to lift the Tardy family in prayer. And we want to lift those who are homeless, those who need, need a place to stay. We want to also lift our nation and our world in prayer. We want to lift up this entire nation. If we've ever needed God, we need and show enough right now. So let's lift our nation in prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We pray that you bless those whose name we've called and bless those who we don't know of, those names we have not called. We ask you to, to heal as only you can heal. Bless as only you can bless. Touch as only you can touch in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you, to, Father God, to continue to walk with us. Give us peace. Give us hope. Give us strength. Lord, we ask you to deliver us from this awful virus of COVID-19. Lord, we pray for every person who has taken the vaccine that they will be healthy. We pray for every person who is awaiting to take the vaccine that they will be healthy. And Lord, we pray for every person who will not take the vaccine that they will be healthy. Give us wisdom. Give us direction. Give us hope. Lord, we pray for Donald John Trump. We ask you, Father God, to bless him to get to know you. 
We pray, Father God, that his heart will be turned toward you. We pray, Father God, that you will deliver him from the grips of the devil. We pray, dear Master, that you continue to walk with him, around him, in such a way that he will have an awakening of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our new president, Joseph Biden. We pray for our new vice president, Kamala Harris. We pray that you give them wisdom, give them safety, give them understanding. We pray, Father God, that our nation will rise up and live out of the true meaning of his creed. We pray, Father God, that all men are, are created equal and will be treated equally. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless us to walk with you. And bless our nation, Father God, to be delivered from, from the grips of the devil. We pray for every race, every culture. We ask you to bring peace. We ask you to bless us to operate in wisdom and understanding. And Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bless us to walk with Jesus. That Jesus will control this nation. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are lifting Jesus, as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, if I, in I, when I'm lifted up, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. God bless you. God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.